First of all, uh, Michael and uh, Julia, welcome to Munich. And it's, I think, safe, safe to say that you had the, the, uh, the longest journey, I guess, coming all the way from Australia. <laughs> yes, very so, long. So uh, th thank you for making the effort. No, yeah, thank no. you very much for having us. Well, yeah, it's really great to be here. The, the topic of today is um, learning a little bit more about sort of alternative plastics, revolutionary materials, um, and also talking about sort of the plastic problem and what, what solutions you know you see and what actually you are you know Ulo your company you the found you founded in 2021. That's right. right? Yeah. Uh, is sort of, of um, is, is, is it might, might provide in the future. So um, let's start by you know understanding the, the 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 plastics as such. Right. So my understanding is there are two types of plastics. One is sort of the fossil fuel. Uh, based plastics that you know we, we used to um, to have, and then the biodegradables, and uh, maybe you can just you know help us a little bit you know understand the basis and uh, setting the stage here. Yeah, no, and yeah, so thank you very much. Um, essentially, in the world today, there are fossil fuel based plastics which make up 99% of the polymer market. The alternatives make up the tiny little 1% that's left. We believe in a world without fossil-based plastics, um, and to do that, we're replacing plastic with materials that are good for the world. We believe there is this certain group of polymers called PHAs, which behave just like plastics today. They're durable, lightweight. They have good water and oxygen barrier properties. You can melt them, you can remelt them, um, but they're compostable. So we believe in a world where materials uh, essentially take carbon out of the air and after use return it to the soil. Um, we're combining PHAs as the group of polymers with the greatest potential to replace plastic because they behave like plastic whilst being compostable and then using seaweed as a feedstock um, to produce those PHAs. Uh, and that's in contrast to others that use crops or waste. We believe seaweed is the greatest or has the greatest potential for scale and sustainability versus others. And, and just to complement that, um, we truly believe uh, on these materials called the PHAs, which is a natural material. And what's special about it is that it really empowers us uh, from going from this linear economy to a circular economy. So they are both, they are like reusable, recyclable. If we get enough of them on the market, you can recycle them. And even more importantly, compostable. So it's not that we, we cannot recycle them. We can uh, still go through those reusable systems and recycling them, keeping them in the economy. But then when those polymers cannot be recycled over and over again, like aluminum and glass, we can also compost and put the carbon back into the earth. So we really believe on this world where fossil plastics are replaced by this organic polymers that do those three things, which is quite special. And I think that's the interesting thing here, right? So that we are not actually thinking about how can we recycle, you know, plastics, how can we maybe sort of collect them or, and then, you know, maybe, you know, clean up the oceans and stuff. Clearly we have to do that. But I think the shocking thing, what, what you told me in the, um, in our pre-discussion and then prep of the, of the panel was that, you know, every single plastic that has ever been produced on a polymer basis, a fossil fuel, uh, fuel basis is still on Earth. And I think that's the shocking thing here, right? Yes, it's, 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 it's crazy. So we started this boom on, on fossil plastic production in, back in the 50s. And all the plastic we ever produced since then, they still on Earth. The exception is when we burn them, which is not a great end up as air pollution. And uh, we believe that the long-term solution for the problem is to leave the fossil fuels on the ground and find those polymers that still do those things that we love about the plastics, being waterproof, windproof, lightweight, uh, but at the same time are both recyclable and compostable. And we believe that our we can do that. Yeah. And now obviously everything that is, you know, that sounds great, right? And the question is really, is this a, is this a long-term solution and is it scalable, right? I guess that's, in the end of the day, the thing we should discuss and understand. Um, is, is it a, do you have a chance to, to replace you know, uh, fossil fuel um, uh, plastics with, with the solutions you have? Yes, uh, um, so by background I'm an ocean scientist and um, I started by looking at the symptoms of the problem by going in the ocean and seeing all these plastics and then you start to look at cleanup technologies and then in recycling technologies which is a kind of a uh, clean up as well and then we will come up with this realization that we actually need an alternative to plastics 
and uh, Ulu was born out of this realization uh, that we're still missing a truly alternative um, to plastic. And there are two things here. One is on the materials. We want things that are lightweight, waterproof, and they're uh, compost at the end. And then there's the feedstock as well. What are we going to replace fossil fuels with? Um, so if you look at the types of feedstocks we have, we have the first stage, like first generation feedstock, land crops, then we have waste streams, and now we have the algae and seaweed, which is what we're working with. And we believe that uh, seaweed, which can be farmed just like land crops, so it's a marine crop, uh, it has those scalability advantages uh, that we have with crops, like if demand is there, we can expand the farms and have large farms, while being uh, as sustainable as working, uh, turning waste into resources, um, because this, we actually want more seaweed in the world. So as a, as a ocean scientist, if we talk with ocean conservation people, we actually need more marine plants in our ocean. After climate change, the second biggest problem we have in the ocean is nitrogen pollution. So we have our sewage, we have fertilizers, as well for cow as well. We flush in the ocean with nitrogen. And one, one way to tackle that is to farm seaweed because it's going to uh, uptake loss of carbon, but also the nitrogen. So we really believe that Aulu joining seaweed with PHAs, we can get to that, scalable, uh, that scale and be able at some point to replace all those 500 million tons of plastic that we produce a year with something that's actually good for the world. I would just add to that as well. So seaweed as a marine crop has lots of scalability advantages. We're starting with purchasing seaweed from Southeast Asia where there's a ready market of seaweed available for hydrocolloids, which are essentially things that you add to food to gel them. They're emulsifiers, they're found in toothpaste, your ice cream. So we're tapping into that existing market today, uh, which is predominantly in China, which is the largest producer of seaweed in the world, and then secondly, Indonesia. And I think in scaling up our process and securing supply from farmers on the ground in places like Indonesia, there's a really strong opportunity to empower those vulnerable peoples in coastal communities as well. So the positive externalities aren't confined to the environment, they're also social. Um, and in particular, 60% of the seaweed supply chain in a place like Indonesia are female farmers. Um, so we, yeah, we, we think there are some re really great social benefits from uh, working with seaweed. Cool. So let's... Um Maybe, I think, Julia, you, you brought some samples, right? I think that's, uh, let's, let's look at this. Yes. Uh, you know, the alternative plastic you can produce while, uh, with seaweed, I think that's, um, that's probably uh, very interesting yeah, to see. So maybe the, the camera can actually, um, you yes. know, zoom, yes. and, zoom and onto it. And as I showed them, maybe I would just it would give a better idea on how we produce Ulu, how PHAs are actually produced. So what we do, like our factory, it looks like a, a, a winery, so it's like lots of fermenters. And what we're basically doing is fermenting ulu, so fermenting seaweed into ulu. So it's like a white powder like that. Uh, that's kind of the fat of this special microbe inside the fermenter, so it's basically eating up the seaweed sugars, and part of the energy goes into this carbon storage inside the cells. That's called the PHA, and it's like a, a white powder like that. And the properties of the white powder looks quite similar to what would come out of a petrochemical company. And from there, you can like melt down into little uh, pellets, which is the commodity of a petrochemical company, and it's where we want to be on the supply chain. And, um, and then from that pellet, you can melt it down. And these are examples that if you are a manufacturer, you can stop buying your fossil plastic pellet and use ULU to, to do your different materials. So this was made with a standard manufacturing gear. It's a melted press uh, film. And then you have a little... Maybe, maybe we just you know, hold it up a, a little bit so that we can see. So yeah, this, is a, yeah, yeah. this is a plastics uh, soft one, right? Yeah, this is a film that's been produced using a melt press um, and uh, essentially taking that powder, turning it into pellets, and then putting it through existing um, manufacturing equipment. Yeah, and this is like a fiber, which is not perfect yet, but it's a dream of ours to be replacing polyester in your clothing. I don't know if you know, but about 60% of today's textiles are plastic. So that's a big dream for us. It's a longer R&D phase, but, you know, getting some prototypes in there which shows that we can also make fibers. And that's basically 
that that could be used for um, for sports apparel, for example, right? Yes. For shoes and also for for clothing. Yes, it, it, this this fiber is as uh, is natural, just like cotton and silk, but it has those special pro uh, properties that we love, particularly in outdoors. You need you know to be waterproof and windproof, so it, it gives those properties that the plastic fibers give you, while being both recyclable and, and compostable. And then the area that we are more uh, getting lots of traction in, because it's where our optimization energy is going, is injection molding. So here you have a little button that's also uh, made with Hulu, and that's probably the first vertical that we're going to go for, while also investing on the fiber development. So it's, um, yeah. And that, that, and that's the interesting thing, right? So it's hard plastic, right? Very, <laughs> and you know, for example, for even for you know, we spoke, we heard you know, BMW yesterday with sort of the circular car, and uh, this could be the perfect solution for uh, you know, panels and and other sort of components in the car, right? That's my understanding. Yeah, that's right. So our material behaves like polypropylene in its default state, um, which these chairs are made out of actually. Um, so furniture, car interiors. Um, currently, 30% of cars are plastic, which is quite um, incredible, um, and very little of that plastic is recycled at the end of life. Um, so there's a real opportunity to um, replace a significant amount of plastic in car interiors with Ulu. I got a question yesterday, actually, when, when somebody approached me regarding the panel, asking me whether actually you can eat it. Uh, not that one. So there are, there are other startups doing seaweed materials that you can actually eat because they take straight the hydrocolloid and they do this hydrophobic edible seaweed materials that's quite good for like straws or wrapping a burger with. Our, I mean, you could, but yeah, if you shop it up very well, maybe, maybe, but I don't okay. know. I never tried. <laughs> it's a little. And, and let's talk about sort of how long it takes, you know, to, uh, so that it's fully, I mean, it's fully compostable, right? So how long does it take that is until it's gone? Yeah, we so. Throw it away. Yeah, like biodegradability depends on a few factors. And I always give a dark analogy. Like you can think about your body if you like, you know, if you're in the Everest and you get in trouble, you're going to last a long time. If you're in the Amazon, humid, not so much. But let's talk, uh, let's imagine a future that uh, this is used in uh, food packaging. You could shop it up your food waste together with the packaging, put in your home compost, two to three weeks, that's gone, and you get a better compost because your food, your food waste has lots of nitrogen. This has lots of carbon, so you get, you get a better carbon-nitrogen balance. So we really believe in the future that sometimes it makes sense to just get rid of things on spot rather than being transporting lots of waste around. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. Let's use maybe the last sort of five minutes to um, talk a little bit about, about the commercialization of it, right? So one thing is, you know, we spoke about the scalability of it. So that's, you know, one important thing to be fully competitive that you have, you can produce at, uh, at scale. And the other is obviously that you can, uh, can produce at uh, competitive costs uh, and pricing. So how, how does this sort of look like? Yeah, obviously, I guess in the mo at the moment, in the early stages, it's still, you know, quite, quite expensive. But the more, the moment you scale, I, I would assume it's, um, it's more competitive, right? Yeah, um, the combination of seaweed plus some innovations in our polymer production process give us a very clear path to competing on costs with conventional plastics, which are about $1 to $3 per kilogram US. Um, I think in particular, we, so we have a natural microbe. We're using a microbe that um, we know the genome of, um, and there's significant scope to uh, improve the production or yield of PHA from seaweed by tweaking that um, genetic profile to uh, encourage further PHA production per unit of seaweed. So synthetic biology is one that we're very excited about um, in helping us achieve parity uh, on cost with conventional plastics. The other, the second one is uh, the seaweed itself. So seaweed is a marine crop. It grows incredibly quickly, um, way faster than land crops. Um, it also contains lots of fermentable sugars, which is obviously very important for our process. Um, those sugars are fed to these microbes. And, um, and it's very early days in the production of seaweed. So seaweed is very popular in uh, Asian countries, but it's still very archaic in the way that, that that seaweed is produced. So we see significant potential for improving productivity, just like corn. Um, you know, back in the day, um, we can... Uh, 
very like uh, yeah optimize the production of of seaweed. Um, and I think the final point there is that seaweed is fantastic because it doesn't just contain carbohydrates, which we use um, for the sugars uh, to feed these microbes. It also contains proteins and lipids, um, things like omega threes, omega sixes, um, protein, which you know, we can uh, move from things like animal feed, where protein is very important, towards even refining this protein for human consumption, vegan protein powder, uh, vegan omega-3 pills, and that additional revenue stream helps to subsidise the cost of PHA production as well and reduce that um, yeah, cost profile into the future. Fantastic. So um, maybe one, one sort of one last uh, comment, um, Michael and Julia. So what, what do you need to... For, um, maybe from this community here and all, or sort of from from corporates, you know, to to scale it, um, to, to scale fast. Or how do, how does this work? Are you are you working with corporates on prototypes, or um, how how do you sort of plan the next phase? Yeah, so we we just closed our seed round. Um, late last year, where we got 8.6 million um, Australian dollars. And uh, our um, sprint for the next 12 to 18 months is to build a pilot plant, close our um, first market of take agreements, and, and also create a brand around our material. Even though we are raw material, we believe to be kind of the Gore-Tex for sustainability. We think we have a very nice story here. And I think in terms of help, um, Mostly, like we're looking for partnerships now. We, we, we believe, even though we can go in many verticals and spread into lots of products, we're really looking for those first customers that are keen to join us early on so we can focus on getting into market with a good product that's now made of wool rather than plastic. Um, we're also hiring lots of engineers. We're going more like fully biotech star, uh, startup to also being a bit of a manufacturing because of that pilot. So if you know good people on the engineering side, we're looking for that. Uh, anything else? I, don't know. I think the hiring one's a good point. We're looking for some very smart chemical engineers, experienced in fermentations, um, and the opportunity to come and live in Perth, which is a really nice place. So. Um. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much, uh, Michael and Julia, for coming to, uh, to, to Europe all the way from Australia. And I think it's encouraging to, to hear and see that and, and really, you know, have it in our hands that there's an alternative to the usual plastic, you know, that, that is sort of still on, still on Earth. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for, for having coming. us. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> thank you.